Hello, everybody. Uh, I've got to uh, go ahead and share this. Uh, all right. Hello, hello. Is everybody here? Am I here? Oh, OK. People are generally here. All right. Um, boy, today we were running late in uh, computer graphics class. Uh, my apologies for that, um, but we will be great. We're always great in here, right? How's everybody feeling today? Feeling great? Feeling? OK, well, that's. Pretty good, I guess. Let's see. Points and vectors. Um, has everyone uh, taken my survey? Is that... Uh, I'm trying to figure out, uh, is everybody feeling good? Um, yes, it's so much excitement on so many different levels these days. Um, whoa, I got to find the right notes here. Uh, conditionals and loops. Nope, not that one. Vectors and physics. That looks like the right thing I want to talk about. There we go. Um, all right. Whew. So we're going to talk about a couple of different topics today. We're going to talk a little bit about um, our project a little bit as well. A um, bunch of varying things about Unity as, as well, of course, always. Um, but let's see. We're going to talk about vectors. Vectors. Uh, we introduced them a little bit last time. This notion of uh, this is not the program you were looking at last time. This is way more complicated than our Unity program. So let's go over to Unity. And let's see if all goes well. I can open up. There we go. There's Unity. And uh, should look kind of familiar, hopefully. And let's see. Let me find where you all are on Discord. There you are. You're up, up in there. That's good. Um, not too many faces. I can't see people, but uh, I'll make the best of it. I will be waiting for comments in the other piece. All right. So uh, in our game here, which uh, things were moving right along, and let's see, we even had a bit of... Uh, a bit of... Bolt last time. So we were continuing. We had our uh, player able to kind of click on buttons and move around within the scene. And we had this notion that was starting to uh, happen in the game manager. If I look at my game manager script, that as you move in the world, if all goes well here, as you move in the world, we were changing the player's X and Y location in the world. And that was our fundamental bit of motion. We were, uh, you know, by changing our position in space, that is movement. What? You know, that's the big thing. Movement. What is movement but changing your location over time? Is that deep? It's pretty deep right? Don't worry, it gets way deeper. We're going to get like four dimensions deep in terms of uh, moving through space. It's going to be really, really, really fantastic eventually. Maybe we'll get there today. So um, we had been sort of doing it at first brute force by saying, okay, we had player X and player Y. We had um, just integer positions of player X and player Y. So we would keep track sort of in a, in a grid uh, almost like a pixel kind of thing, you know, moving up and down, um, you know, across for X and up and down for Y. So we're in a two-dimensional game for now. If we were in three dimensions, we would have Z and we'd move sort of in and out of the screen, but we're not going to worry about that yet. And really for the most part, this semester, um, we're going to focus on kind of two-dimensional motion, X and Y kind of space, right? Most of our games will be two-dimensional games. We'll have X and Y. So we won't worry so much about Z, but we'll have to worry about it just a little bit 
um, but not too much, just a little bit, because in order to look at something in two dimensions, you have to be beyond, you can't be on the same plane as the thing you're looking at. This is where it gets really deep, right? Imagine you lived in a 2D world and you were on a flat plane. How could you ever look at the plane? You couldn't really see. You have to be off that plane in order to see what's on that plane, right? So you have to be, you have to have a third dimension to be in order to be able to sort of observe the other two dimensions in all their glory. So we're going to be a little bit of 3D, but we're going to be working with our game more or less in 2D. And our vectors and our physics, for the most part, are going to reflect that. Okay. So in our game so far, we had this player X and player Y. And I introduced at the, toward the end of last lecture, this idea of vectors. So a vector is normally sort of a tuplet, right? In this case, it's just two units. We have an X and a Y that are joined together to present or to represent one particular thing which has a X component and a Y component. So it is a multi-dimensional thing as opposed to, you know, a, a X, which is just a measure of one dimension, or Y, another measure of another dimension. If we have a vector, it is a measure of both of those simultaneously. So that's the the joy of vectors. We'll we'll talk about, and they yes. No, it's vector two means it is a vector with two components. It means it has an X and a Y. A vector three would have three components, an X, a Y, and a Z, okay? And then there's even going to be, you know, potentially you can have even higher order vectors, um, which we're not going to be dealing with much, <laughs> if at all. Um, so usually we're dealing with two vector twos, which are two dimensions, right? X and Y. And when they're declared, like if you see this part in here, I declared it. I said, I want a vector two, and I'm giving it an initial value for it's X and it's Y, right? That's what's happening here. That's why if it was a vector three, you'd probably see zero comma zero comma zero, meaning the X, the Y and the Z are all zero. But for now, it's just a vector two. And so that's what that is. Now we've also in this, we're also learning a little bit more uh, sneaking in some additional C sharp in here in that you'll notice this new, um, this new, structure here, this new uh, word that we haven't seen before. And what new is doing is saying, okay, if I need to create an instance of something that's not just a simple data type, that's not just an integer, a float, or something like that, that is an actual class, and a vector is a class, in order to use one of those, I need to create it using new, right? For that there. Otherwise, it's just a reference to it. If I said vector to player position, that's a reference to a vector, but it's not actually a vector. That's why this new says, okay, give me an actual vector that I can refer to. All right. So this is sort of conjuring up or instantiating or creating a new vector that I can then refer to through this over here. So I can say player pause, player pause X, player pause Y. Um, there, which we'll see as we sort of get start going through it here. All right. And yeah, I guess this is where we, we last, we were doing some, some calculations on the fly here saying, okay, I can turn this player X and player Y, these two into a vector to give me a vector representing where the player is in the world. And then I have a vector that's where the goal is in the world. And I can have a vector that is the quantity or the, the the vector points from one of them to the other one so I can see how far apart they are in the world and so on. So before diving back in the code, let's let's uh, have a bit of uh, presentation and whatnot on vectors. So let's talk about them. Now vectors show up a lot in physics. Okay. So um, typically when you're trying to represent some kind of velocity or motion in the world, you are expressing them in terms of, you know, normally in the real world, you'd be expressing motion in terms of three dimensions. And you're going to have a speed that has a X component, a Y component, and a Z component, right? So this is, vectors are really, you know, kind of go hand in hand with physics. But there's other places where we might use vectors as well. Um, 
But if we are going to use a lot of the built-in physics in the Unity engine or any other game engine for that matter, we have to kind of agree on certain ways of representing things in space. And that's one of the reasons that we, vec we use vectors in that place as well. So I refer to this as letting the engine be the engine and that we can really, instead of kind of even moving things one place at a time, kind of just by pressing buttons and whatnot, we can actually even kind of couple that to real physics. All right, so we'll touch on that a little bit here. There's going to be no real physics in your first project. So don't get worried about that. Don't get too concerned if I, if I mentioned some physics today. Um, just think of the concepts and don't worry about the implementation until after you've done kind of the basics of your first project. All right. So in order to understand vectors, let's talk first about numbers, right? A number, a straight, you know, just a normal number is a measure of something. It's a amount. It has the magnitude of something, you know, how much X is there? How much Y is there? How much sugar should I put in the recipe? How much salt should I, whatever. There's just a single dimensional quantity. It has just a magnitude, right? So imagine if we had uh, two points. Now, points are not just numbers, right? A point on a number line might be a one-dimensional point, but it doesn't really give us a good location in space. Instead, we want to have points in space. And if we want to know how far apart two points in space are, we can express that as a distance between the two as just a single number, right? If I was to stand anywhere arbitrarily on my front lawn and uh, my cat were to be out there, it doesn't matter what the, the kind of the direction is. I can always say, well, the cat's five feet away from me. That doesn't tell you too much other than the cat's five feet away from you. It might be in a circle around me. You don't really know where the cat is. You just know that it's five feet away from me. And that sounds like an awful lot like a number again. Okay, so if you want to figure out how far apart two points are, you can calculate the magnitude of the distance between them, and you can represent that distance as a number, right? In things like in our game, when we're saying, oh, did I hit the wall, or am I close to the target, or am I near a enemy, typically that notion of near or when we were working with the volume of a sound, that is a single number, right? That's a single quantity that is that single magnitude or distance. So it's a very useful thing to have. And no matter whether you're two dimensions or three dimensions, there's still, you just have some distance, some magnitude in between. So it is important to understand and have that concept of magnitude, no matter how many dimensions you're working on, okay? But often you do want more information. You want to know where are, how, what is the relationship between these things in space? It's not just a matter of distance. You're figuring, you know, are they facing? Are they, you know, is it to the north of me? Is it, you know, to my left? And so on, right? You want to find out some sort of relative nature between the two, right? You want to know where the second point is relative to the first. And for that, magnitude is insufficient. You need direction as well. Right? You need to know how far away it is from you, and you need to know what direction it is. Right? If I want to go get my cat, I have to say, okay, the cat is over there, knowing the direction, and it's five feet in that direction, so I can go walk over to it. Right? So I have direction and some magnitude. That would give me a way to get there. Right? So that is the vector. A vector is a measurement of magnitude and direction. It allows me to say, okay, what direction do I need to go in and how far do I need to walk to get there? Or if there's like something chasing me, I could say, well, okay, how close are they to me and what direction do I need to run in to get away from them, right? So the cool thing is, or, or an interesting thing about that is, um, even though it feels like it, you might think that vectors have some notion of location. They really don't, okay? Positions are a, ki a particular kind of vector um, in that we often use a vector to hold an X and a Y, and we assume that that's some position in the world. Now, what it really is, it's an offset from a origin that we agree on. So we just say, okay, there's somewhere in the world that is zero, zero. 
And then I have a position X and a Y, which means I am that far in X direction and Y direction from the origin. So a vector is actually expressing the position in terms of an offset. So I know how far is it offset and how far from the origin is it, okay? So vectors are really not positions unless you know what their origin is, okay? If you assume it's zero, zero, then you know where they are. So you have to know the origin of a vector, where the tail of the vector is in order to know where the head of the vector is. They do use that same notation as points though. So you need to sort of be careful. We're gonna be normally, you know, kind of, you know, from a data structure point of view, they're identical. They both have just an X component and a Y component. And that built-in, you know, position has that built-in assumption about the, the location, the origin. So, but often now we're gonna use vectors to describe things like velocity, force, and sometimes an offset from another vector. So if you think about velocity or force, or the imagine the speed of your car. The speed of the car might be 90, to, 90 miles an hour in that direction. It doesn't matter where the car is. It just matters how fast it's moving and what direction it's pointing in. That's really the vector, right? The origin doesn't really matter. You know, I mean, in the case of you know, just, just expressing the vector. If you want to say, well, how far am I going to get from this point over a course of time? Well, then you have to factor that in. But the vector that's expressing that quantity is really just instantaneous. You know, it just doesn't know in the world where it is, right? So the cool thing is you can add vectors to each other. And what you're doing is you're just adding the components. So if I want to move x and y by a certain amount, I can add the x to my current x, I can add the y to my current y, and it will move me in the direction of that vector. Okay, So vectors can be uh, offsets from position, and you can even add a vector to a vector. But you cannot add positions. So imagine you have a location in the world, a very specific location, that's, you know, the position in my front yard, you know, standing at a position in my front yard. And I said, okay, add to that the position of you standing in the middle of the horseshoe in front of the union. What does that mean? It doesn't really mean anything. You can't add those positions. You could subtract the two and figure out the direction and the distance to go from one to the other but you can't add them together. You can add that vector to one of them to get to the other one, but there is no real concept of adding two locations together. So that's kind of a fun, you know, mind blowing sort of thing. So you can add an offset to a position to get another position. It's like we have here in the slide, original position plus some offset vector gives you a new position. Right, so if I said, okay, I'm standing in my front yard and I need to add five miles due west, that's gonna get me to the, be standing somewhere else. I can do that. But you can't add positions, but you can subtract them to get the offset between them. So this is like big brain type of stuff, you know, stuff to, that'll start to feel more fluid and, and fluent as you deal with them more. But it's the concept to deal with, right, to think about. So. Vectors, this is how we're gonna represent them. We talked about it a little bit. We have vector twos and vector threes. Vector twos are the two dimensional vector with an X and a Y. And a vector three is a three dimensional vector with an X, a Y, and a Z. And it does sound like a point, but I do have to stress, it's only a point if you assume that there was a zero, zero origin. And that's how you far you moved from that origin to get to that point. So here it is. Vector has a direction and a magnitude. The direction you go in and how far to go in that direction. So movement is the act of adding a vector to a position, right? Changing position based on the addition of this vector, this offset. If you need an example, here's an example. So say we had two points, two eight 
and 5-3. A is at 2-8, B is at 5-3. And I wanted to express one in terms of the other. I could say, well, the vector in between the two or the vector pointing from B to A, right? You subtract the one that is from from the one that is just two, right? So I'm saying I'm gonna point to A from B. So I subtract B from A and I get this one, negative three, five. So if I add, what happened? I went backwards here. I subtracted the two. And then if I want to get from B to A, I would say, okay, B minus three gives me two, three, sorry, sorry, sorry. Five plus a minus three gets me there. And then three plus five gets me to eight. Here we go. I can remember to add now. So five minus three gets me to two. Three plus five gets me to eight. So this is the vector in between the two of them. Everybody's mind's blown or do you got that one? Let me see. Okay. Going to be handy. Right, so there it is, there's, there's the vector. And if we take that position out of the equation, pardon the pun, we take that five, three out, here's the vector, negative three, five. And that in and of itself, if we just looked at that, we would say, well, it's all we know is maybe if that's a point, it's an uh, offset from the origin. So we would think that this is the end point for that vector if that's where it was, okay. So that's why we gotta remember we're using a vector in terms of some origin to get there. All right. So there are some common operations and they're going to enable us once we kind of, you know, put the, 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 the vector in our bag of tricks, there are some common operations that we're going to typically use over and over and over again with vectors. Eventually we'll get more into dot products and other mathematics. But one of the most basic things is, the length of the vector, the magnitude of the vector, which tells us how far things potentially are from away from one another. And from that, we can figure out, okay, how loud should something be based on how far it is from us? Or should we say, ah, okay, the distance decreased or the distance increased, so I should tell the player, you're getting warmer, you're getting warmer, the magnitude is decreasing between the two. You're getting colder, the magnitude is increasing between the two. That's one of the common things we use in the in the homework in this uh, project to say, okay, well, you need to let the player know because you know their flashlight turned out turned off. So, but they you you can still tell that you know you're getting warmer or colder, and you can use a calculation of the distance, the magnitude of that vector between the two. Okay, and the way it does that. This is a simple Pythagorean theorem. How many of you heard have heard of the Pythagorean theorem? You know, usually uh, everyone should raise their hands right now and immediately, you know, Pythagorean theorem, piece of cake, right? Um, the hypotenuse is, of course, the sum of the square of the both sides, square root of the sum of the square of both sides, right? So if this vector was 1, 1, the length of that vector would be 1.414, right? to be the square root of two, something like that, All right? So the number, the F, the question is, what does the, the F after the numbers mean? This means that we're dealing with floating point numbers, right? So we have decimal numbers. Sometimes you'd have double precision numbers, but we're gonna be using, Unity likes to use floating point numbers. So for things like position, we're gonna abandon using integers. We want the decimal locations, right? Because we're not dealing with something in terms of like pixels on the screen or finite boundaries. We wanna be continuous. We wanna be able to like position ourselves anywhere, right? We don't know, you know, the, the uh, for example, this, this uh, length isn't some nice, easy number one, number two, number three, right? It's an actual, we need, we need decimal precision for that. So we're going to use a floating point number to represent that. So that's why we say float length, whoops, float length equals offset magnitude, right? And this is a vector two that has, you know, that's a floating point. Normally a vector two uh, is going to be two floating point values that we're going to hold. Okay. So shouldn't it be 1.0F? It would work either way. It should work either way. 
So you're being more explicit, but I think that's going to work just fine. I hope it works just fine. It's been a while since I tested it. Um, so what does that tell us? So if you want to change the magnitude of something, like imagine you know we're using a vector to represent speed in a certain direction. So if I want to increase the speed in that direction, I can just multiply that vector, which is the uh, act of scaling, right? It's increasing the length, which means increasing the speed, you know? So to multiply, to, to change the magnitude, all we have to do is multiply the vector by some value. Like here, you can see offset times equals two, and I could have, that could have just as easily been maybe even. This would be doubling that vector, right? So the magnitude of this doubled vector would be 2.82. Right? So if you want to double the speed, normally speed or velocity or acceleration or force, all these things are going to be expressed in terms of vectors. So if you want to double the amount of force or double the amount of speed, you're going to be multiplying the vector by some scalar. Right. Multiplying a vector times a single number. A single number is called a scalar. Right. So multiplying a vector times a scalar is a uniform scaling operation. I mean, you could, yes. Um, it's not measuring from anywhere, really. It's just telling you the length of the vector. Right? Remember, the vector really doesn't have, you could, for sake of argument, imagine it was at zero, right? So the magnitude, if, if the vector was, had, was at the origin, the magnitude would be how far from the origin the head of the vector, the, you know, the, the head of the vector is pointing, the arrow, the tip of the vector, okay? So you could change, you know, the, the, the offset could be added to any position. So if, you're, if you have a position that the, the uh, player is at, it would move it by, you know, two in X and two in Y, which would be effectively moving it, you know, changing the, uh, the position with a magnitude of 2.82. Exactly. It doesn't say what the direction was, but the overall impact of that, of adding that vector is a change of 2.82 in terms of, you know, that's the, the magnitude of the change. Good question. Uh, let's see. So what did I do? Okay. So if you wanted to scale it, you want to uh, scale, you're basically stretching the vector. If you want to set it to some constant value, if you want to set the magnitude, like you say, okay, I want to set the, this uh, to 50 miles an hour, then you can just set it to, um, well, you can't, it's kind of tricky, I suppose, to set it to 50. How do you say, you know, if you're moving southwest at 50 miles an hour, how much do you need to change the X and the Y? I mean, if we assume that they were at 45 degrees, you could do the math and so on, but say you weren't, you know, moving in an exact direction or you didn't know exactly, there's actually some built-in operations that allow you to easily change the uh, magnitude in, this, in the direction that's already moving on. And this is getting a little bit more advanced. And you'll hopefully just remember this later when you run into it. All right, if you need to set the magnitude, you can do something. You can basically stretch or scale the vector to a pure direction, meaning that it has no magnitude other than one. It set the magnitude to one. It becomes what's known as a unit vector, right? So if you've heard the term unit vector, it means a vector that has a direction, but its magnitude is only one, which means it's a, just a pure direction, right? Vector of length one. And you can turn any vector into a unit vector by dividing it by its magnitude. 
So if you said um, offset divided by offset, or offset, yeah, offset divided by offset magnitude, you're going to turn it into a normal vector. The easier way to do that in Unity, you can actually just say offset dot normalized. It'll do that for you. Again, this is important if you just want to figure out the direction something's moving in and you don't necessarily want to know how fast it is. Why might you need to know that? Imagine you're looking the direction that your player's facing in, right? You, want to, you don't care that they're necessarily moving in at a certain speed. You just want to know that, yeah, they're moving in that direction. Something like that. Okay. So those are the basic vector operations. Now, sitting behind that, let's, before we get into the, some of the math, let's go over to Unity to kind of uh, put this a little bit into use. So let's come back over here. And so instead of the player moving according to X and Y, now the easier, the better thing to do, and you'll notice if, in, if I'm in Unity here and any of these objects that are on the, the uh, screen, even if they're just the game manager or the canvas or anything even on the canvas, they always have a oh, the canvas items are trickier to deal with, but uh, let's go to the boom box here. It has a position, which is an X, a Y, and a Z. And this position is a vector. It's, it's held in a vector, even though we just said, well, vectors and, you know, it's assuming from the origin. It also has a rotation and a scale. So I'm going to put something into the scene now. I'm going to say, um, well, that's the weird picture. Uh, have another picture. Images? Nothing in images. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll use this picture. So I was doing some research on, uh, what was I doing? So you go to the main camera and we'll zoom in here. We have the main camera. I'm going to put this picture in. This is a picture, a design for Dr. Strange's Sanctum Sanctorum for some interesting reason. So this is just a picture. It is just a bitmap. I've dragged it into the scene. And this object is created an object for me here. And it has two important things on here. One, which is a sprite renderer, which tells us which sprite it's referring to this image. So this sanctum image is really just this sprite here. And everything else determines how it's going to be drawn. So you can kind of ignore that from now. Uh, if a vector includes a rotation and a scale, what's the difference between a vector and a transform? OK. A vector in and of itself cannot include a rotation and a scale. It can have been affected by a rotation and a scale. But once you've performed those operations on a vector, it no longer has the sense of rotation and scale. It just has direction and magnitude. Once it's a vector, it only has those two things, right? You potentially could use it to represent, you know, if you said, well, okay, here's a rotation around an axis, but that's, you have to have more information than just the uh, direction and magnitude for that. So yeah, the question in case of, for those seeing or on the stream, if a vector includes a rotation and scale, what's the difference between a vector and a transform? A transform is basically, is usually a matrix operation performed on a vector, right? We can transform a vector, okay? Um, and in Unity here, when we're looking at this object and we see this transform, you will see it has a position, a rotation, and a scale. So what this is doing, it's, it's a little, it's, it's fancy. This combination of these things, it's saying, okay, imagine you had a point and you have a transformation matrix, which might be, you know, if you said, okay, this is actually located at zero, zero. If you assumed everything started off at zero, zero, 
you can then translate it somewhere in the world, rotate it, and then scale it. And that'll give you a, a, a position and orientation and a scaling. And that's what a transformation does. It does those, potentially does all three of those things simultaneously. So transformation is much, much more than a vector. And in order to really represent it, you need more to, that's why there are these additional numbers here, right? So if I just change this, you'll see X, I get a translation. And Y is also translation. A translation is a shift. And I can translate Z, but you notice we're not going to see any change there. Now, why is that not changing? Even though, well, I, I've set this up as a 2D game. And in a 2D game, it assumes a certain type of camera, which is a orthogonal camera. So, or an orthographic camera here. So I'm clicking on main camera for those of you following along. Um, and uh, that means that no matter what the Z is, it doesn't change perspective. And what perspective is, is you know, as things move further away from you, they get smaller. As things move closer to you, they get bigger. That's perspective. And because we are using an orthographic camera, we have no perspective. I change its perspective, and now I change Z. You see the camera view is actually changing here. Whereas if I had an orthographic camera, it would not be. So that's the cool thing about a orthographic camera or a perspective camera. We're gonna use an orthographic camera because we're getting too far afield on, on cool stuff. Um, so let's get back to it. Okay, so let's click on the sanctum again here. So we have a transformation that includes a position or translation that we can perform. Then we have rotation. And we can rotate X and rotate Y, and nothing happens. Why is that? Well, because we're, again, we're in two dimensional space, right? What does it mean to rotate X around, around the X axis? It really, in our case, it doesn't mean anything. We can't actually rotate in those directions. We can only rotate in terms of Z. Because any rotation in X or Y would mean that we would be going outside of those two components, that X and Y. That's kind of the, the crazy thing about geometry, right? If you rotate around one of the axes, you're gonna basically be rotating into, potentially into another dimension. And we don't wanna do that, which is why in the case of 2D games, we only have a single rotation that we can do here. If instead, you know, we went back and we changed our camera again. And now, I think this will let's do this. And now we start to do this. You'll see what happens with X and Y. But that's only because it exists in three dimensions. Let's go back to zero, zero in our 2D plane, we really only want to deal with Z rotation. Okay, so keep that in mind. In a 2D game, we deal with position in terms of X and Y, and we deal with a single rotation, which is in Z. Scale, on the other hand, scale, we can use X and Y, because it's scaling one of those two dimensions. And we can't scale Z because we can't scale in that dimension. So even at a scale of Z is zero, nothing changes. So how does that work? How does that actually work? Well, we could jump back into the lecture notes here. And it is, in order to do transformations like that, to have a transformation matrix, transformation is we actually do, we use a matrix. And we multiply that matrix by our vector, right? So this is, this is linear algebra. I don't know if you've had linear algebra yet or how many of you had it uh, already. 
But what we're doing is we're taking this set of nine values, this three by three matrix, multiplying it by a, a hom um, hom homogeneous uh, version of our vector, which means we have this one down here because we have we, we can't multiply a, uh, a two by a, a three by three by a two. We need to have a matching dimension here. We can mul multiply three by three by a, a, a three by one. That's okay. All right. Don't worry about this too much. But these are basically the, the transformations that can be done by that matrix, by a multiplication between that matrix and the vector. So we can do a translation by adding values here, scaling by multiplying across the diagonal, across the, uh, you know, in the uniform direction here. And then rotation is going to be rotation around the origin or around the Z axis. And that affects both the X and Y position, which is why you see it having components in X and Y here. Okay. There's some other skew and shear and all kinds of crazy things, but we were going to leave those off. So these are the math behind these operations. Now, thankfully, because you have an engine, you don't have to worry about these. You can kind of just do them. They're sort of built in. So we're not going to really worry about all that much. Um, and we're going to leave off until next time for dot product and the actual rigid body stuff. Because instead, we're going to talk a little bit more about the project. So we're going to split this into um, the other uh, for, for Thursday or Friday. Excuse me. Any questions Lar largely thankfully using an engine that's why I, I like to say at the beginning of this lecture you know letting an engine be an engine is because it's going to do a lot of this stuff for you but you need to at least kind of be cautious and aware of kind of what's going on and in the initial game this is why I like to you to do just a little of this by hand right this notion of um, you know working with things in terms of their components or even deciding, okay, I want to combine these things into a set, right? So let's just say for us now, if I wanted to have, excuse me, I have, um, where are we? I created these vectors on the fly down here, but what I should really have is I should say, well, I have the player position here, vector two for player position. I should have a vector two for the, goal position and well room is kind of different right i don't really have a room position i have a room width and height so i'll leave that for now so the player i want the player to start off at a certain position and before it was 12 divided i'm just gonna make it six and three so player pause equals new vector three. That's going to be assigning it to uh, the position six, three. And it would probably go ahead and convert this for me correctly. But I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, do that. And I'm going to say the goal is at uh, 11, two. And I'll also, uh, just to see, I mean, now, now let's see if it, it actually works. That'd be good to check. And for good measure, I'm just going to delete those. And if I tried to save and run right now, of course, it's going to fail on me because I haven't fixed it. I haven't fixed any of those values yet. So let's see what happens, what it complains about. Um, let's go to Unity, and we'll hit Play. All compiler errors need to be fixed. We can go to the console, and it's going to tell us player X does not exist. Right. So here's our player X. So what do we use for that? We say player pause.x. Is that what I said? Player pause, yeah. So player pause dot lowercase x. That's how I refer to the x component of that vector. And I'll use that here as well. So anywhere I had x, I can substitute player pause dot x. Now, you'll notice I don't need to use temp player anymore, and I shouldn't need to use goal anymore there. 
And instead, I'm now I can say, okay, what is the distance between player pause and whole pause? And that will give me the distance vector between the two. And then I can look at the magnitude of that. So I could tell how far apart they are and also what direction they could go in. So we could say, I'm just gonna put this in the console. I could say, if distance back dot x greater than 0, So if the distance vector is greater than zero, I could say a message like, you need to go left or right. I'm not quite sure which it is. My head here. So if it's less than zero, and I could put an else here if I wanted. You need to go left. Let's see if I got that correct. So I'm going to go back to my game. And if I've got everything else fixed, hopefully. Oh, I better fix player Y. Uh, and this part down here. So I could say player pause Y plus plus works just like the other version. And this one is going to be x and x. Where did I? Oh, there we go. Player. Player. Why? All right. So now I've got what I consider to be good. This is using vectors and not using specific x and y positions. Hopefully they're all gone. Yes. OK. There we go. Now I've just got some bolt errors and things. All right. So let's see in our game. You'll notice I have a background here. That's fun. So it says I need to go right. I think I've got this backwards. Because now I'm going, if I hit the wall, I should obviously need to go left. Let's see, do I get closer? All right, I got them backwards. So let's fix this. You need to go left, go right. And let's, similarly, let's do the same for Y. And we're going to say up and down. So we're saying, OK, if the distance there is greater than, so meaning the distance is in the negative direction or the positive direction, I need to go one way or the other. Okay. All right, now it all goes well here. So the distance is 5.3, and it's saying I need to go right and up. So I'm going to go to the right. Yep, the distance decreased, so I'm going in the right direction. And do up. Up. Oh, I got that one backwards because I'm going in the wrong direction there. This is what happens when you make up stuff as you go. So we'll say negative, and this one is testing for positive. 
All right. So without giving it away, I'm not telling the, the, the player, okay, you need to go exactly in this direction or exactly this far towards there. I can give them a hint as to where they need to go, All right? So similar to my warmer, colder, I want to give them sort of vague instructions here. And I probably want to put that. So let's see, I, I move and I'm at four. This is my debugging over here. And I could say, ah, okay, they need, I need to go right and down. So if I went right, right, right. Oh, I need to go left. I need to go down. And notice magnitude is zero. I need to go up. Magnitude hits zero. So I've, I'm at that position. The player is at 2-2. Two, two. Is that right? Oh, I broke something there in terms of that output. Let's uh, fix that. Let's go back to uh, this. What did I say? The player is at... Whoops. Position... X position Y. All right. We're doing okay. We're going to kind of wrap this up. We're going to talk about what this means now. So if the, if I look over here, I'm going to see that I've positioned my goal at what? 11, two. I'm going to start just moving and it says, okay, I've got to go to the right. All right, 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 right. And I hit 11.2 and the magnitude is zero. Okay. And if I go so it's not telling me exactly where to go. I could follow that. Now, this would be the interesting part. Now, in the requirements, we said that there is a uh, requirement of being able to use a flashlight or use some sort of thing to help the player find the, uh, the goal. So this information here, you need to go right, you need to go up, you need to go down. That's pretty um, explicit information. So maybe we don't want to let the player know about that all the time, every time they move. Like we might be using the sound continuously because they always have sound, but maybe they only see up, down, right, left when they're using their flashlight. So in order to do that, we would use another type of UI element called a toggle. This is what uh, I like to see used. Um, so we'll go to the scene, uh, go to the hierarchy canvas, and I'm going to put a toggle. So where is it? UI toggle. No, grab it here. Oops. And I'm going to set the text on there to flashlight, perhaps. And by default, let's see, we're going to turn it off. Is on is going to tell us what it is, right? So I could check to say, okay, if the flashlight is on, print that out. Give the user that information. And maybe I give them that information in another text object which is going to be our little hint here. So we'll call this hint message. And we'll just put a dummy value of hint there for now. So we have flashlight, which is the thing that we're going to toggle. And the hint, which is the information we're going to help them get. 
And this other text is going to be the one telling them a story or something like that. Is anyone still there? Seems everyone's awfully quiet. Okay. Whew. Okay. Say, uh, stop me with it. You know, like I'm, if I'm saying something crazy, let me know. Okay. Um, I think my watch is slowing down. So what time is it? Oh no, it's, I'm, I'm close to being on time. Um, all right. So I have now the makings of something interesting. I can move around. I have general information and give to the user. And then I have this flashlight. And when they have the flashlight turned on, I'm going to give them a little bit more information. I'm like, they need to go left, right or something. Cause I don't want to give it away. I don't want to say you need to move exactly. Right. That's, that's always my thing. So I'm probably going to want the game manager to know about this hint text. So we'll do this. We'll go back over to our game manager. And it had main message ref. So we also want to have int ref. And just in case, we'll have toggle ref. So over here now, I'm going to let it know about those items as well. So the flashlight is going to be our toggle. And the hint, where'd our hint text go? Hint message is going to be our hint reference. OK. So let's try out a simple thing. So I want to be able to have something happen when the flashlight is toggled. So let's have a public void flashlight state. And it's going to be passed a Boolean called on. No, it's not inside update here. OK, I'm just creating a function. I haven't even, this is not attached to anything, right? So. Um, I want this to do, let's see, when you add ref to the, um, that's just part of it, part of its name. I just decided that I just, uh, it's not a special keyword. It's really this, the keyword here is just game objects. I'm just, I'm, I'm just letting myself know that this, these are references to some other game object. It's not one I created, right? So it's just a reference to something else. Um, if I'd said, something equals new game object, and that would be a real game object that I had a reference to or something. So I'm just using that to, to indicate I'm referencing something outside there. All right. So I could then say print. Um, oh. Let's see what happens. Oops. Not that. This. There we go. So somehow I want this to be called to turn the flashlight on or off. So similar to the button, I can come over to my interface here, and you'll notice there's an on value changed. And I can say plus. And within the scene, I'm going to call my game manager, and I'm going to call the game manager function that is called, where is it now? Flashlight state, which is being passed a bool. Now, there's this uh, check here. And the problem would be, OK, well, how do I let it know the state? I don't want it to just be passed a true or false here, or sorry, here. I want it to be the state of this flashlight. So if we look here, under game manager, there's flashlight state right here, which is a static parameter. And there's another flashlight state up here, which is called dynamic bool. Dynamic means it's changing. So a dynamic is the, the value of this toggle. So if I select that, it will pass, you'll notice it doesn't, that check mark, 
check mark, check box goes away. And it's going to pass in that value. All right, so if I play now and I tick that box, okay, when I went into here and I said game manager dot flashlight state and I or, or game manager. So to select which function I want to call, there's actually it, it kind of acts as if there's two versions. Flashlight state, which is just being passed a Boolean, or call this function flashlight state with the dynamic version. All right. So use static parameters and dynamic. All right. So use make sure to use the dynamic version there. So now I'm going to press play again. And now if we go over to our console and I click that, you will see flashlight false, flashlight true, and so on. All right, so it's calling that function, passing that value as we go. Now, to make this a little bit easier to see, I'm gonna have to either move or shrink my sanctum image there. Uh, so just kind of get it out of the way. All right. So now let's see if I can see it. Okay. One more time. All right. So you can see flashlight. You can see it changing up here. So if the flashlight is on, I want it to print that hint message here. And if it's off, they shouldn't get that print that message. So let's go a little further. And then uh, let's see. Let's try to do this a little quicker. Um, in here, where I was calculating that. We said, here I checked, right? In my check position and collision, I set that to there. But just like the other one where before we said main message ref get component text of that main message. Now here I wanna do something similar and say, hint message ref, or is it just hint ref? Hint ref. Hint ref equals you need to go left. And I'll do similarly here. Now, does anyone see anything wrong with what I'm doing? That is true. That's one piece of the problem. But the other piece of the problem is that I can only set this. And if it comes through here, this is going to get set. But then it's going to come in here and reset it. So I, I probably will never see this left or right message. I'll only see the up and down because that's the last one that gets set. That's the challenge, right? I can't because it's a it's a it's a um, assignment. So an interesting thing you can do is with strings you can add things to strings. So we can tack on something to the end of the string if we want, right? But I might need a special case here where what happens if they were directly on the right path, I need to fill in the blank.
maybe just uh, you need to, because now I have to be smart here. You need to and go up. No, that won't work. I could say you need to go up. You need to go down. But now I need to say you need to go left and Maybe, but then what if I don't need down there? So it gets it's, it does get into this kind of interesting situation where you're not sure. Um, so you need to go left. You need to go right. You need to go up. You need to go down. But if it said you need to go right, go up, that would be wrong. Um, So we would need to say, this is where it gets kind of clever. You get to be like creative in terms of how you can kind of tack these things together. Um, you need to go left. So if we put an end at the end of each one of these, You need to go left and go up. You need to go right and go down and go up. You need to stop and go up. All right, so that would work. So the stop is kind of a, a little just to make it read right, to make it read correctly. So let's see if that, uh... so let's get that part right first. So it says you need to go right and go down. So I'll go right, right. Still need to go right and go down. Up. Oh, you need to go right and oh, you need to stop and oh, that means I got it. So you see, it still needs a little bit more work to figure out exactly how to, you know, indicate the message to the user for the situation where they are on the correct X or on the correct Y. So I'll leave that as part of the exercise. And it also, it did it dis, it disregarded the flashlight being on and off. So I should put something in there to say, well, it, it should be dependent on the flashlight being on or off. So I could then, I could easily say, if flashlight on, all of this stuff in here is dependent on the flashlight being on. And I need to somehow keep track of the flashlight being on. And I would say, cool. And it'll start off being false. So now, in our game, we should see. No hints I mean, it is printing out all kinds of good debug information there. But if I turn the flashlight on and start to move, ah, nothing happened. Why is that? Go ahead. Show me how silly I am. Someone tell me. That's right. I never actually said flashlight on equals on. So I had to make sure that's the value I'm checking on up there. So I should make sure to check, you know, to set it when someone actually does something there. So now if I press play, it should do the right thing. Now in the description, um, so we see we don't get a hint. Now I turn that on, and now we get the hints. Oh, what happened here? Go right, go right, stop. Okay, I found it. Yep, 11.2. So the messages are giving me uh, good info to go by. But I can infinitely have the flashlight turned on. So this is, this is uh, when I say a managed resource in the description of the project, I mean that the flashlight 
or whatever it is, should only have, say, maybe a certain number of charges, right? So you can only have the flashlight on for a certain amount of time or a certain number of moves. So every time you press one of these buttons, if the flashlight is turned on, you should subtract one from the remaining charges of the flashlight. And if that hits zero, it should automatically turn that off. For example, yep, yep. Well, but you could have it on and have it continuously on while you walk around, it'll be continuously giving you the hint. That's right. So, and this is now. This is this is not a this is not really a real time game. This is a a sort of turn based game, right? So every turn is when you click a button. That's a turn, right? There's no real clock going on. That's why we're going to say, okay, if you every time you say a button was pressed, that is one turn was taken, right? Right. Right. Or you could even go so far as to say every time a hint is given, that's a charge of the flashlight. Right. So inside of here, I might say flash I'm pseudo coding now charges minus minus. Perhaps. You know, flashlight charges would have to be defined up here. I'd have to say, and since charges are something that's just kind of integer based, I could say flashlight. Oops. Ten. I have ten flashlight charges, and every time I get a hint. I subtract one from that. And I could say if flashlight charges less than equal zero, then I want to do something here. I want to turn off the flashlight. And that might be done. Notice we have ways of setting the text. There is in the flashlight, you'll see this is on is the thing that is indicating us being on or off. So I can look for the is on part of the toggle component of the flashlight which might be something like probably give it away now. Flashlight ref toggle. That's not right. Was it toggle ref? What did I say? Toggle ref. <laughs> Is on. Turn the flashlight off. Otherwise, it's OK to do this 
Does everybody follow that? If the flashlight was on, I go ahead and use a flashlight charge. And if there's any charges left, then well, if there aren't any charges left, I turn the flashlight off and I don't allow it to be used. And I should also say this. So the flashlight should be turned off. The toggle should be turned off. Everything is turned off here, right? The moment the flashlight charges gets down to zero. Understand the flashlight? I have a poll over there in the... Uh... All right, somebody does. At least one person, that's good. So I'm going to assume everybody understands that. No. So let's give it a try. This is, uh, thankfully, this is recorded and you can try it on your own. But this is the sort of thing where it's it becomes, it's it's a fairly sophisticated state that we're in here, right? Because we want to say, well, um, the... You have to manage that so you can't always be just the flashlight can't always be on. So I start with it on, and maybe I should also print out the number of charges I have left, perhaps. So now you'll see as I move, if I had 10 charges and I move 10 times, eventually, nothing's changed. Oh, no, it is still changing. I must have uh, not done something right. So what's going wrong? Did I not save it? I didn't save it. Um, so here's what I'm going to do. Just to make it explicit, I'm going to say flashlight is off if charges is equal to zero. Say that again. Oh, and I've gone beyond my check-in time. Um, so let's do this. Let's say, so check-in time today, people who are supposed to be here, let me see who's here. We'll do sort of a quick group check-in. Uh, this being a Tuesday, let's see. I, uh, who's here? N-I-G-O-G-M is not here. So let's see. Let's see. If we're assuming that this is the second and even Tuesday, then that means I don't see everybody who's supposed to be here, even if it's the odd or even. Oh, okay. So you're here. Um, but that would be even or odd. This was so easy with my other class here. So Zheng GZ5, are you here? Uh, okay, so you're here. Walsh S4, are you here? Yes, you are. Q-I-A-N-M. Uh, here, okay, great. This is what we're doing. You guys are fantastic. GX6, I think I saw you here. Yes. And last but not least, Lid H10. Let's see, where are you at? Uh, uh oh. Hmm. We've got our first. A wall person. Okay, so we'll track that down. So the question is, um, among of the, the, the so you you are here. So the question is, have the group of you at least this is your chance. You're in the spotlight here. Um, are you able to follow along? Do you have at least the button set? And given what we have now, um, let's see. If I saved my code, let's save my code and run it now. Oh, I've got a bug. 
how do you feel about actually being able to implement this is the question. Um, and I have you down as Friday. Okay, so you're using keypad controls rather than the button, but you do have the implementation of button on screen. So you're using an on, uh, like a get key command. Is that right? Okay, so I would like for you to, you know, I really do want to see the use of the buttons uh, within the GUI. So clearly, if you're going to use the toggle, ah, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. So this is another way. What what uh, G has just pointed uh, has posted his code here or her code. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm their code. Let's say um, they're doing the X and why incrementing, decrementing, but according to a key code. Now we're gonna talk, be talking later about input and input is the, the normal way to get input without going through the GUI, without going through the user interface or the canvas. So that's an alternative. Um, so what I would recommend though, is go ahead and leave that code in there, but could you create a stub, you know, another function that was something similar to what I have here for was button pressed so that if you have buttons on the screen, that they also are being used along with the, the other one as well. Okay. Um, or at least if you don't want to do it that way, if you want to, you know, as long as you demonstrate the use of buttons, text on the screen, the toggle, that you can really kind of demonstrate that. Um, yeah, you're, it's probably the main thing about it is what I'm looking for is demonstration of solid understanding of the uh, UI system, right? And one of the most important things is this connection of events to code that's being called, right? So I want the action of a UI event triggering a function in your code, right? So just like we have game manager flashlight on the toggle calling this code in here, right? That's the, the important part, the, the ability to connect something in the Unity UI through an event to a function, to a public function in one of your scripts. Okay, so as long as you can demonstrate that, that's kind of one of the main things, All right? Um, you know, really like the case of the flashlight state or something is that's gonna, you know even more elaborate than the simple button pressing. But uh, that's the nice thing about you know the UI is that you have all the things built in in terms of you know the, the feedback of clicking on a button. Uh, if you wanted to use different objects, different things, and it o always overlaying on the screen. So I like to make sure people kind of understand the uh, the UI before we get too far into the, a lot of the other things on there. All right. So let's see. I, I want to make sure that this is working before I entirely... Uh, whoops, I still have what I have here. Bold to user options. No, 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 no. Um, I thought I fixed that. Flashlight is off. Did I not say I didn't save that? There we go. All right. All right, that's gonna have to suffice for check-in. Um, or do any of you, I guess you're, you're getting by. Um, so flashlight is off, flashlight is on. Okay, I need to go left. And the flashlight turned off there, right? Because I had 10 and now I'm blind. So now I have to go around blind and this is why it's important to have the sound because once I run out of, you know, if I, if I'm, if I'm not careful about how much I use the flashlight and you'll notice I tried to turn it back on again. And of course it didn't let me the moment I moved, it turned it off again. All right. 
So part of it is a game design question, right? You don't want the, you, how do you make it so that the game is challenging? Given the very few parameters, all it is is, you know, it's, it's feeling around in the dark, sort of, right? But you want to give the user some, some opportunities and, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, listening for the subtlety of the volume going up and down of the sound using the volume manipulation that we had like last time, which was in checking the position. Let's see here. Uh, magnitude of the volume. And what happened? Why is my background music playing? Distance vec magnitude. Yeah, we thought the audio should be playing too. Maybe I'm not. Uh, I probably turned off. Where's Boombox? Yeah. All right, it's probably gonna be really, really loud and blow me out of here. But if I, I'll go. I'll turn play on awake, and I'll loop. Oh, play on awake, and I'll turn on my audio source. That was weird. All right. So it's very quiet right now. I'm going to turn off my flashlight. So it's kind of subtle here. I actually did find. Now, what should happen is when the position of the, when the, the magnitude of the vector goes to zero, that's when I win, you know? So maybe I make the room bigger. Maybe I put obstacles. Maybe I put, you know, kind of things so that the player can't, you know, you impede the motion of the player as they try to move in certain directions. Like right now we had it. So if you banged into the wall, you couldn't get past, or maybe you have to find, feel around and get past the door or something by, you know, saying, okay, if, this value is allowed, you can kind of get past it. Or make the room bigger. You know, that's right now the room is pretty small. You can cover it in a very few number of turns. Make the wall the room a little bit bigger. Um, so the idea is, you know, again, that you have some sort of modality so that you can move around. And if you can't quite tell how close you are, you can momentarily turn on the flashlight and get the hint. Okay, go right and down. I'll turn it off again. Now go right and down. Well, that seems weird. I need to go right. Oh, it's because the flashlight isn't on. Oh. Left and up. Pretty quiet. Oh, let me check. Stop and go up. All right, turn that off and just go up. And now I've hit eleven two. So I would play. I would, you know, hitting the uh, actual thing. So if I got into here and I said, okay, magnitude equals zero, or magnitude is close enough, I should play some hooray sound. You know, or let the player know you found it. Okay. So that's the idea behind there. Um, let me open up for questions in general at this point. I guess the, the, we've kind of been rolling the lecture and the live streaming. Um, so given the demonstration today of using a toggle, having it, you know, okay, I have a certain number of charges in my flashlight. And the question you, to put to you is really, okay, how much of that information do you want to share to the user every time they go and how do you want to keep score okay one way to keep score might just be every time the user clicks the button or you know every time they press an action their score goes up by one right so you, the, your goal is to find the goal in as few moves as possible right you also might if you wanted to be really tricky say all right, let's have some obstacles in the room. I forget on the requirement on obstacles. I don't think this time around, maybe I, I have the requirement. So you could, in your game manager, do something like say, well, okay, in addition to there being a goal, so if I look here, I could say, ah, there's an enemy. So maybe here there is an enemy. 
and say I'm just going to have some random location for the enemy. Um, three, two. And say, OK, if the flashlight is on, tell them that the enemy is nearby. Otherwise, if they hit the enemy, they're, they get penalized points. So might say something here like, OK, distance vec, that's the distance vec between the um, player and the goal. But let's do this. Let's say, all right, the first thing I want to do is say distance vec is player pose minus enemy pose. And I could say if distance vec dot magnitude less than 0.2. So it basically hit the enemy. Imagine here I'm gonna, you know, communicate to the to the to the player. Uh, you lost five points. And then you can make the enemy go away. How do you make the enemy go away? Well, easy. Enemy pause equals, and we'll just say, We're going to put the enemy then someplace where it can never be seen again. That's this is just cruel at this point because the player can't see the enemy; it's just going to bump into it. So, what you should really do in this case is, as part of this flashlight being on, maybe even before checking that part, you could say, "Well, if they're close to the enemy, warn them." Right? So I could say, now instead of this distance vec, I might have distance, uh, first one uh, is going to be distance enemy vec. Uh, I could say in here, Something like at the very end, if distance enemy vec dot magnitude less than two, that's close enough. Give them some information, okay? If I if they were close enough and their flashlight was on, you scared off an enemy. And also, I'll get rid of the enemy here. All right. So... Again, it's sort of it's 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 very open ended, <laughs> very open ended. The idea is, you know, using just the simple if else and using the vectors and magnitudes to see am I close to something? How do I express that to the user, to the player? Uh, so think a little bit about a design. So here I've got a, a thing. Okay, I'm in a room. It's like saw or something like that. You know, well, it's not saw. I don't know. Some some enemy in the room with me that I want to be careful to avoid. And so I want to be careful about moving around. I might just bump into them. And uh, if I bump into them, it's five points. But if I get within two of them and I'm using the flashlight, I can scare them off, right? So maybe now, end of the game. And so gameplay would go something like this. And I'm not looking, this isn't going to be like super even gameplay. Um. So we'll play the game now. And I forget, where did I put the enemy? I put the enemy at 3 2.
Okay, in the console... I hit the enemy, I lost five points. So I would need to do the right thing there. But now the enemy's gone, so... So let's start over. And say, well, okay, let me move around carefully. And I'll sort of manage my flashlight here. I'll turn it on. And I'll move this way. Oh, I scared off an enemy. So I can turn it off now. I need to go right and go down. Scared off an enemy. Good. So I'm going to go down. I need to go right. I still need to go right. I need to stop. So I had, should have my hooray sound there. Okay. Uh, so be creative. You know, we're not going to get into graphics yet. Don't want to stress out on graphics and physics and rigid bodies and colliders and all that sort of stuff. It's really to kind of, you know, use some very, very simple logic. And then next game, we're going to get entirely into everything is going to be automatically handed, handed by the engine. But for now, we just want to get an appreciation for sort of the, the logic that goes into things and, you know, using the vectors and the positions and so on. All right. Um, if there are no other questions, I'm actually going to stop there, if that's all right. Um, I'm going to stay on, though, so I'm going to be on for questions, but I'm just going to stop the streaming. I need to take a quick five-minute break. I'm going to continue to be around for a while after this, um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop the stream and take a quick break. So thanks, and uh, thanks for doing the informal check-in, and we'll see everybody, everybody on Friday as well. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Have a good Wednesday, Thursday. <laughs>